Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build this Crusader Mark III. As you probably guessed, with absolutely no help from the box or video title, this is a 35th scale plastic kit by Border Models. This is, in fact, my first Border Models kit, and it will definitely not be my last. I did a what's in the box video on this kit a while ago, so if you want to have a look at the sprues and other stuff that comes in the box, you can do that by clicking the link in the description. I won't be showing that in this video, we're just going to get straight into gluing bits of plastic together, starting with the hull, onto which we attach these suspension-y doodads. There are different parts here for different positions on the hull, so refer to the instructions to get those in the correct places. The instructions note that if you want workable suspension, you can cut off some of the nubbins here. I would like my suspension to stay in one place though, and that's why I'm using glue to secure these parts. Eventually, when we've got all the suspension parts on, I glue the lower front plate into place. This is simple, and the fit is pretty good. Into the holes at the front of the hull, I add these axially things for the idler wheels. I spent some time nudging these to get them on nice and straight, but the outer hull side part will do that for you, so you might as well put these on at the same time as those outer plates. It does of course work the way that I've done it as well, it's just ever so slightly more work. The same goes for the little axle things for the drive sprockets. These are, obviously, a little bit different to the front ones, so be sure that you're using the correct parts. I add the rear hull plate next, and this pretty much drops right into place as the front plate did. Nice and easy. Then, I add these, well, I guess they're part of the final drive casing. The instructions kind of look like you might be able to put these on after the outer hull side parts, but it will be a lot easier to do this before they're in the way, so that's what I've done. This is pretty simple, though you might need to fiddle with them a bit to make sure they're nice and straight. After making sure there's plenty of glue to avoid a smiting from the glue god, I add the hull sides, and you can probably see how they guide the parts so they sit nice and straight, so there's no real need to eyeball it like I did. I follow this by adding the upper hull part. The instructions don't tell us to do this for another few steps, but it's not going to hurt to do it now, and it means any detail parts we do add to the upper hull probably won't get damaged when I apply pressure gluing the hull part on because those details aren't there yet. And now, the first photo etch of the build. I'm not totally sure why this has to be photo etch and not plastic, but it is what it is. I thought I could get away with using the plastic base part to bend the photo etch around, but I wasn't able to get very sharply folded corners, so it could look better. Oh well, it could be worse. Next come these little things, I'm not sure what they are, but it probably has something to do with the exhaust. The little round things go on the ends of the large blocky thing, and they're definitely a little bit tricky to kajigger into place, and I'm sure my badly bent and thus slightly out of position photo etch doesn't really help. I almost lost one of these parts trying to use tweezers with a bit too much force, but the god of flying parts took pity on me and it landed on the desk. When all of the circular doodads are in place, it's time to add this thing which has some exhaust pipe on it. Why not add a hatch next? I figured gluing the two halves of this thing together before trying to install them into the hole would be a sensible way to do this, and it was. When it's together it goes in here, easy as you like. Other variants of the Crusader would have a machine gun turret here, but not this one. The kit doesn't even have parts for it, so the bits box is a bit sad about that. Oh well. As I'll do a few times in this build, I add the handle after the hatch is already in place. It's just a bit easier to do this, and you avoid potentially damaging the handle if you need to apply pressure when installing the hatch. This little box for, who knows, something British? Tea? Whatever. This is made up of two parts, and it goes together like so. Then we have a photo etch latch. This box can then be set aside until we need it, or you could just assemble it a bit later. Next, I assemble a pair of, well, I'm not really sure what they're called, are you surprised? I'll call them air intake covers because I think that's what they might be. You need to attach the four side parts to these, which isn't really tricky at all, though some of the parts did have a little bit of flash on the back which obviously needed to be removed. They go into place on the engine deck here like so. Obviously be careful to put them around the right way. 
As before, the handle goes on after the main part is in place, to avoid potential damage. The whatever they're called for the tank's right side is a bit different to the one on the left, in that this bar thing gets glued onto the outer side, the slightly bigger side. It also needs this piece of photo etch, the end of which needs to be bent into a U-shape, which I probably haven't done very well, but I did do it. There's a couple of little nubbins that link into the holes on the photo etch, so it's not especially difficult to get this into its place. That assembly can then be glued onto the engine deck like so. Next, I add these side panels. These add some rivet detail and hide a couple of gaps, and shouldn't be too challenging to install. There's one for either side of the hull. Then, some shackles. These don't quite lock into place, because the surfaces that contact each other are flat, so you'll have to nudge them a bit until they're in the right place. Now, we can attach that little box I made earlier with the photo wedge latch. As you can probably see, it would have been a bit difficult to get that little plate into place with this box in the way. Why not now install those exhaust assembly things? They're just sitting there and they've got to go on at some point, why not now? There's some keying to guide these, so unless you're doing something very wrong, this should be pretty easy. That large opening in the engine deck can be fixed with this hatch. The box shows that you could model this open, and you can, but with no internal detail, I don't see much point in doing that. Now it's time to build the little armoured compartment for the driver. The instructions say to assemble this separately, and then glue it to the hull, but as you can see, I'm a rebel, and I'm building it directly onto the hull. I figured this would probably ensure a better fit, with fewer gaps. The sides and front go on pretty easily, and then I add this little hatch thingy. Next to that goes a little door. Obviously it's a bit too small for the driver to pass through, so I would say it's more for looking through, and maybe some fresh air. The little hatch was a bit tricky to get into place, and it might be slightly easier to model in the open position, but I did eventually get it into place. On top, these, I assume they're opening hatch parts, because that's what they look like. Either way, these two parts are simple enough to place, and they look pretty good. Then, this armoured cover goes on the door. It was a little bit hard to see how this should go on in the instructions, but I think I've got it right. Now, for some spare track links. These are the same as the regular track links I'll be installing later. There is in fact a jig for this, but I didn't realise until after I'd put these together. I'll show you later. I did these links in the more difficult way, putting them together, lining them up and then inserting the track pins, which is one pin on either side. This is not exactly a difficult process, it's just a bit annoying and rather time consuming. Though I will say, the pins are kind of weak, so if the holes don't line up for whatever reason, they will bend. Eventually I got the spare track links together in two sets of three links. They can be glued into place in the little bracket thing on the front right of the hull, which is rather simple. More tracks later on. For now, it's time to put the stowage boxes together. There's not a lot to this, you just glue the doors on. But this one, for the right side of the tank, has a tool of some sort attached to it, though this is also pretty easy to put on. There were also some little photo etch bracket things that look like they're meant to prevent the doors from opening too far, but I lost one of them, so I didn't bother putting any of the others on. But Herbert, you need that! Quiet, you. There are another two stowage boxes, which are a bit shorter and wider, and they go together in exactly the same way as the other two, though no additional tool parts. These two go onto the hull here, next to the turret ring area. I've decided to model one of these open, and I plan to put some tools in there from a mini art set that I've got. The long thin boxes go on behind those, and you might be able to see that there's a couple of guide knobs to help with these. I did consider gluing this toolbox lid into place, but I didn't know if the turret would interfere with it, so I just left it off. On the front of the hull I attached this armoured plate. As you can see it was a little bit too big for the space, but I sanded it down a bit, and with a bit of pressure it stayed where I wanted it. Next I add this, I think it's a fire extinguisher, which was meant to be glued onto the stowage box earlier, and I must have forgot. Still, it goes into place rather easily now as well. Now, headlamps. These have clear lens parts, but because the clear part also has the blackout covers, which are surprisingly not meant to be clear, I decided I would just glue them together and paint over them. 
While they're bonding, I attach some brackets to the front of the hull. These are easy enough to put on, though you might have to do a bit of nudging to get them to sit neat and straight. I give those a bit of time to set, so that when I put the shackles on they don't immediately just flop out of place, and while that's happening, I install the headlamps. These are both different, so be sure that you're putting the correct light on either side. Otherwise, somebody on the internet might get angry at you, and you don't want that. Oh no. Then, the shackles can be put on. These are the same as the ones I put on the rear earlier, and they still don't clip into place, but they are a little bit tight, which is why I was concerned about knocking the brackets out of place. There are four shackles on the front, and you may need to kajigger them a bit so that they're sitting properly according to how gravity works, and I'm sure you can figure that out. Next, front mud guards. The parts are shaped such that it would be pretty hard to get them on wrong. I mean, you could if you wanted, I'm not going to stop you, but you would have to put some effort into it. Now that the headlamps have had a chance to bond, I add the brush guards. This isn't especially difficult, and they're not quite as fiddly as brush guards can be in smaller scales. That said though, you should still take care when doing this, because they are still thin, easily broken parts. Now seems as good a time as any for the external fuel tank. I start by gluing the two halves of the main barrel bit of the tank together, and they can be put together either way. I would suggest test fitting to figure out if it fits better one way over the other. Once that's together, the two end parts go on. There's a little bit of keying here, so they only go on one way, and it's pretty simple to get them into place, as you can see. The handles go on next, and it's as simple as plopping these right into the mounting holes and doing a bit of nudging to get them straight. Then, a mounting bracket. Two of them, actually. Be sure to put these on the right way around, or you may end up with a weird looking fuel tank, and people would point and laugh at you, or something. We could put this on the hull now, but instead of that, I set it aside. I figure it would probably get in the way of adding all of the other hull rear details, like this towing hitch mount. Either I misread the instructions here, or they weren't clear enough. So initially I glued the two bracket halves together, which is not the way to do it. The way I've done it in this video here is the correct way. Fortunately I was able to pull the parts apart and do it properly. We might as well glue that onto the whole rear now, which was a little bit more fiddly than I expected it to be, but it did go into the mounting holes. The hook goes on next and there's nothing tricky about this. Above that, this little, I don't know what it is, but it's probably something towing related. Whatever it is, it is an easily broken piece, so do be careful not to bump it too hard. Now for some more photo etch. This hose holding thing for the fuel tank. A lot of these photo etch parts have a sort of line etched into them, so you bend them at the correct position. Not this part though, it only has the lines at the ends where it joins the hull, but it needs to be bent in the middle too. I got it done, but it does look a bit messy. Let's just say that it's battle damage. Yeah, that'll do. There's more parts that needed bending, and these, fortunately, had the marks, so they were a bit easier to bend. There's a couple of little brackety things that need to be glued onto the bottom of the venti thing on the hull rear. Oh, such technical terms you're using, Herbert? Yes, they are. Anyway, this is fairly simple. I follow those with these little brackets, and I'm pretty sure I put these in the wrong way. But they won't really be all that visible, so I guess I'll put out a pan to collect rivet counter tears anyway. Delicious. Next, I add the bracket for the fuel hose on the rear of the engine deck here, like so. It's not perfect, but like I said, battle damage. And here's this thing. I've no idea what this is of course, but it needed some bending, and then two more of the square brackety things glued onto either end. Then it goes in here between the vent fins. It was a bit fiddly and a bit annoying, and it does look a bit messy, but I'm pretty sure it's mostly going to be hidden by the fuel tank anyway, so I'm not all that worried. On the inside of the final drive casings, I add these tiny little nubbins, whatever they are. Obviously they're fiddly because they're tiny, but not impossible to install. I suspect these have something to do with lubrication, or maybe they're just there for fun. Wouldn't it be fun to add a couple more shackle brackets to the rear of the hull? Hell yeah it would, so that's what I did, right here. Instead of adding the shackles, I glue this outer part of the final drive casing into place. The one on the right side went on really easily, 
The left one required a bit more fiddling. Maybe I just didn't glue the little outer edge thingy on quite as straight as it should have been. Then, on those parts, I glue these things which have an angle. The pointy bit should be on the outside, if that makes sense. You can see how I've done them. Then, more photo etch. Woohoo, yay. These aren't too bad. A simple bend, and then you glue them onto the angled doodads I just installed. I wasn't 100% sure I got them in exactly the right place, but this looks like what the instructions want. I follow that with some more shackles. It might have been slightly easier to do this just after adding the brackets, but it's not too hard to do it now either. And that's all of the hull rear details on. Let's add the fuel tank. There are some fairly obvious indentations this should mount onto, so it's pretty easy to put this on. Next, I add the fuel hose. I kind of expected this would slot all the way into the photo etch bracket, but it doesn't. It just kind of sits on top, and I'm not sure whether or not that's an error. Also, it probably would have been a good idea to wait for the fuel tank to be totally bonded into place before doing this. It did shift a bit when I tried to put the hose on. I got it into place in the end though, and it does look rather hose. Time for wheels. First, the spiky wheel. That's a drive sprocket, Herbert. Yeah, I guess. The spikes aren't really all that spiky anyway. These are keyed, and they go together easily. Once they're together, you can roll them along the length of track on the sprue, just to make sure the teeth properly mesh with the tracks. And they do. Next, polycaps, which go into the road wheels. This is a little bit odd. Polycaps usually go into drive sprockets and other parts that are intended to move, like gun mounts. They do stop the wheels from wobbling on the axle though, so we may as well add them. Nobody wants a wobbly wheel, and it's not like they stop the wheels from going together nice and easily. Next, the idler wheels. No polycaps here, but they do have a problem. There's no hole to mount them onto the axle. So I drill it out and then widen the hole as much as I need to with my knife. It's not hard to do, but it is a bit weird that you have to do this. At this point I have built a couple of kits, and I've never had to do this before. It does say that you have to do this in the instructions, so it's not a manufacturing defect. Or maybe it actually is, and they noticed before printing the instructions. Either way, it's not really the worst thing in the world, and once that's done, the idlers go together nice and easily thanks to the keying. We end up with this really nice pile of wheels. We are going to need some tracks in a minute, so I might as well show you how that little jig works. You put the links in here, and it can hold five, but I only put in three to demonstrate. The top goes on, and it nicely holds the links in place, just as you might expect it to do. Then, track pins. It would have been a lot easier if they'd spaced the pins on the sprue such that they would fit into the links, but they didn't. So you've got to clip them off and then insert them into the hole. Not every link is good and sometimes the pin doesn't fit, and they do bend rather easily, which adds a bit of frustration to putting these tracks together, and it wasn't really the most fun thing to begin with. I made four sections of about 20 links each. There should be 117 links per side, but fortunately we can get away with doing far fewer than that. I put the wheels on in their appropriate places. Five road wheels on either side, idler wheels at the front, and drive sprockets at the rear. The drive sprockets do fit nice and snug, but they are still movable, which is what we want. Don't glue them into place unless you want the track installation to be slightly more difficult. This kit comes with two lengths of track that you don't have to assemble, enough to fit under the road wheels. This definitely gets a thumbs up from me. It means we can glue a section of the individual track links we put together on either end, obviously making sure that the tracks are around the right way, which I think I did, and then it's a simple matter of kajiggering the individual links up and over the idler wheel, and on the other end, the drive sprocket. This is why you want the drive sprocket to be movable. It allows you to model enough tension on the tracks without having to shift the flat section forwards or backwards. And we don't need to worry about the upper run of tracks because of side skirts. These go on nice and easily, and unless you shine a light up there and look really hard, these will hide the fact that a good deal of track is missing. Only the whiniest of babies would complain about not having those tracks there. I really don't mind putting together individual track links, but even I have limits and it just makes sense to avoid what would probably be a couple of hours work if you really don't have to do it. 
Moving on, it's now turret time, and I start with the gun mantlet, into the back of which I glue this little rectangle. This is to hold the machine gun barrel, and it's simple enough to install. Onto the front of the, I don't know what you would call it, machine gun barrel frame thing? Whatever it is, the front needs to be glued on like so. And then, why not install said machine gun? You'll notice that the end of this barrel isn't solid. Border models were kind enough to slide mould this, so it does look rather good. This kit comes with a nice metal main gun, but the only instructions are for the plastic gun, which does require the internal gun breech part. Initially, I went along with those instructions, with a plan to use the keying on the very back of the plastic gun to join the inner parts to the mantlet, because the metal gun wouldn't go back far enough to do that. It did take me a couple of minutes, but then I realised I could just glue the mantlet onto the front of the turret, and then just glue the main gun onto that, and there's no real need for any of the internal parts. I didn't glue the gun on at this point, but I could have if I wanted. Instead, I put this semicircular piece of plastic on the bottom of the turret here. I follow that with this ring. This is what will actually engage with, I guess you might call it the turret ring, on the hull. Not really much of a turret ring, but it's what it is. Sorry folks, no locking tab mechanisms in this kit. I then glue the upper and lower parts of the turret together. The instructions seem to want some of the details to go on the turret before doing this, but I didn't see a real need for that. The parts fit together really nicely, which isn't really a surprise. So far, everything else has fit really nicely too. I glue the turret front on next, because why the heck not? I did need to apply a bit of pressure, but it goes on nice and neatly. There's a few details for the insides of the turret hatches, but you'll only need those if you're modelling the hatches open, and I'm not. However, we do need to put this vision device together. This was kind of annoying, mostly because of the two small bits that go on top. It would have been a bit more annoying if they didn't have keying, but I did still have a fairly annoying time of this. It just seemed like these parts really didn't want to cooperate. I did get it all together in the end though, so the hatch isn't going to have a mysterious hole in it. That's nice. Speaking of hatches, I use those as kind of spacers to ensure that I'm getting the rear section of the turret roof into the right place. This is probably a lot better than just gluing it on and finding out later that the hatches won't fit. And then I insert the vision device I had so much trouble with through the bottom of the right hatch. I guess I could have done this earlier and just glued all of the hatches in place as I was fitting the rear roof section, but this way works too. Next, for whatever reason, I didn't install the hatches. Instead, I bent some more photo etch. Hooray. This one wasn't actually too bad, and I do appreciate that the lines more or less force the parts to be bent into the correct place, but I still don't enjoy photo etch. This is an antenna mount, and I can see why photo etch would be used for this sort of thing, but it could have easily been some plastic parts too. Oh well, I got it done, and I don't think I did too bad a job with it. I super glue it to the right side of the turret, and there's a couple of little guide knobs that link into the holes in the bottom of the part, so it's not too hard to mount. I chose to follow this with the installation of the hatches, and this is easy enough. They are a little bit gappy around the edges, but that's not a bad thing. The handles come next, and as before, I've probably avoided damaging them, or at least nudging them out of place, by putting them on after the hatches are in the turret. Now, time for another piece of photo etch. This one only needed a simple bend, but it is kind of tricky to get the exact angle right. I got pretty close though. It goes on the right side of the turret just in front of this little rectangular thing, and this will be a mount for a searchlight, so I might as well assemble that. Like the headlamps, this does have a clear plastic lens, and I figure if I'm going to paint the headlamps I might as well just paint over this as well, so I don't have to leave the clear part off. Simple. Why not mount that now? Here you can see how I bent the mounting bracket closer to the proper angle. Then I super glue that lamp on. There's a couple of little photo etch handles for this and I was tempted to leave them off, but I didn't. The instructions say to put these onto the lamp before mounting it to the turret, and if you ask me, that way lies frustration. It's much easier to have the turret hold things for you. These two bits of photo etch are fairly simple strips that just need a couple of bends, and they're not that hard to get into place. The upper, smaller handle was a bit more fiddly than the first one, but I got it on close enough to where I think it should be. 
It's definitely not perfect, but I guess the slight misalignment might add a kind of feeling of life to this. I would imagine thin handles like these could easily be bent out of place on the real thing, so maybe that's realistic. That's my story anyway, and I'm sticking to it. I do think this lamp looks pretty nice with the handles on it, so while it was a bit annoying to do, I don't regret it. Next, why not add the antenna to the antenna mount, or at least the base of the antenna. Then I add a series of four lifting brackets around the turret. Then this, I'm assuming it's a ventilation cover, goes here. I'm not sure if the text on this part should be oriented in a particular way or not, it probably should be, but it's not. Good thing I've left out that pan to collect the rivet counter tiers. Covers for the vision devices come next, and these go over the top of the vision devices, strangely enough. There's already some stowage boxes on the hull, but why not have another one for the turret crew? This is another one that could be modelled open if you prefer, and maybe you could find something to put in there, possibly some 35th scale boxes of tea. I'm modelling mine closed though, so no tea will be visible. This shovel goes on here like so. Tank crews really love digging, and a shovel is essential gear. Then on top of the box, I add these tiny latches. I'm not sure how well you can see them, but the detail here is pretty good. I set that aside to bond, and then, instead of leaving it to the very end and making hilarious jokes about something being missing, I install the main gun. This is pretty much just a matter of supergluing it to the front of the mantlet, and then making sure it's on nice and straight. Superglue doesn't handle shearing forces very well, so if you knock the gun or drop the turret, it'll probably break off. Try to avoid doing that. Next, I glue the stowage box onto the back of the turret. There's keying for this, so you don't have to guess. Then, why not add some antennas? Everybody likes a nice antenna ring. This one goes here, nice and easy, and then this one goes into the mount on the photo etch bracket. It is quite thin, and I imagine it wouldn't take much to break it. It could be replaced with some brass wire if you're really worried about it. I then attach the turret to the hull. Like I said earlier, there's no locking tab mechanism here, but it is a pretty firm fit, so it's not just going to fall right out of place if you pick the tank up. It might do if you turn it upside down, but maybe just don't do that. Anyway, here I was thinking I've just finished the model, but something is missing. This bar thing. I guess I just wasn't paying enough attention to the instructions, because this should have gone on when the side skirts went on. I glued the side skirts on and then went on my way, blissfully ignorant that this part should be on as well. I'm not sure what it's for, though the box art shows a bag strapped onto it, so maybe that's its only purpose. Either way, it is quite simple to install. It is a bit bent, and it probably could have been unbent, but I think it's fine the way it is. We can always say battle damage. The box does say that there is stowage included, and I'm not sure if that was actually included and I somehow missed it, or it just wasn't there. I'm pretty sure it just wasn't there. That's probably something I should mention, so I guess I just did. Anyway, that's the 35th scale British cruiser tank Mark VI Crusader Mark III by Border Models completed. As you can probably see, I've sat the forward left stowage box door in place for now, but when it's painted, I'm going to put some tools in there from a mini art kit that I've got. It made sense to me to paint that separately and then put it in when the tank is painted, but that won't be for quite a while. It is a cool idea though, so that's why I'm talking about it, and it does kind of excite me, so I am putting this model fairly high into the painting queue. Still, probably don't hold your breath for it, it'll take me a while to get to. Anyway, I'm really pleased with this kit. I think the end result is quite nice, and the detailing is very crisp and convincing. I'm not a crusader surgeon, so I couldn't point out any inaccuracies or anything like that, but it looks the part to me. It was quite a fun build. If you watched me stream it, you probably heard me complain about the photo etch quite a bit, and I probably whined about the tracks a bit too, but I just don't enjoy photo etch in general even though I do often like the results it gives, and the photo etch isn't bad or annoying enough to ruin my enjoyment of the build process. Some might find the individual track links in this kit to be a pain, and I wouldn't say that's unfair. Having two little pins for each side of every link is not my idea of fun either. They certainly could be worse though, and it's a mercy that that length of track that goes under the road wheels is included. It would be nice if there was a similar part for the upper run of tracks as well, not that I would need it, but it would be nice. 
I'm pretty glad I was able to use the side skirts to hide that missing track, and I don't think there's anything I could possibly have gotten out of putting all of those links in and then hiding them. Still, I would take those individual links over the dreaded rubber band tracks any day. This wasn't exactly a quick build, I think I spent a little bit under 15 hours building it. Of course, I did do most of the work live on stream, so that does slow things down a bit, but I'm willing to pay that price. Streaming my builds is a lot of fun, and you should come and watch. Just saying. Anyway, I think this is a really nice kit, and it's the first one from border models that I've built. I don't currently have any other border kits in my stash, but I will, at some point, certainly be picking up some more. Okay, I'm kind of waffling now, aren't I? If you've got any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comment section below. If you've built one of these or any other cool models and you want to share, why not drop by our friendly Discord community and show us some pictures? We'd love to see what you've done. If you want to watch me build kits like this one live on stream, head on over to my Twitch channel. The link is in the description below. And if you've not already done so, why not subscribe here on YouTube for the low low price of $0.00. .00. Or if you've got the means and you want to help the herpaderpaderp do herpaderpaderp things and see my videos a bit early before there's any ads, consider becoming a patron. You can find links to Patreon and all of my other things like Discord and social media in the description below. As always, I shall return soon, so until then, be excellent to each other, have an amazing day, and thanks for watching. Farewell.